A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells New York The Macmillan and Company 1922 Copyright 1922 Brought to you by ExploreTraveler.com for your enjoyment and the ability to learn for free, and to convert this learning into college credit via testing. Disclaimer, this audiobook was created from content that is no longer copyrighted, and is public domain in the USA. A Short History of the World I. The World in Space The story of our world is a story that is still very imperfectly known. A couple of hundred years ago men possessed the history of little more than the last 3,000 years. What happened before that time was a matter of legend and speculation. Over a large part of the civilized world it was believed and taught that the world had been created suddenly in 4004 BC, though authorities differed as to whether this had occurred in the spring or autumn of that year. This fantastically precise misconception was based upon a too literal interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, and upon rather arbitrary theological assumptions connected therewith. Such ideas have long since been abandoned by religious teachers, and it is universally recognized that the universe in which we live has to all appearances existed for an enormous period of time and possibly for endless time. Of course there may be deception in these appearances, as a room may be made to seem endless by putting mirrors facing each other at either end. But that the universe in which we live has existed only for six or seven thousand years may be regarded as an altogether exploded idea. The Earth, as everybody knows nowadays, is a spheroid, a sphere slightly compressed, orange fashion, with a diameter of nearly 8,000 miles. Its spherical shape has been known at least to a limited number of intelligent people for nearly 2,500 years, but before that time it was supposed to be flat, and various ideas which now seem fantastic were entertained about its relations to the sky and the stars and planets. We know now that it rotates upon its axis, which is about 24 miles shorter than its equatorial diameter, every 24 hours, and that this is the cause of the alternations of day and night, that it circles about the sun in a slightly distorted and slowly variable oval path in a year. Its distance from the sun varies between 91 and a half millions at its nearest and 94 and a half million miles. Luminous Spiral Clouds of Matter Luminous Spiral Clouds of Matter, Nebula Photograph 1910 Photo, G. W. Ritchie About the Earth circles a smaller sphere, the Moon, at an average distance of 239,000 miles. Earth and Moon are not the only bodies to travel round the Sun. There are also the planets, Mercury and Venus, at distances of 36 and 67 millions of miles, and beyond the circle of the Earth and disregarding a belt of numerous smaller bodies, the planetoids, there are Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune at mean distances of 141, 483, 886, 1782, and 1793 millions of miles respectively. These figures in millions of miles are very difficult for the mind to grasp. It may help the reader's imagination if we reduce the sun and planets to a smaller, more conceivable scale. The nebula seen edge on. The nebula seen edge on. Note the central core which, through millions of years, is cooling to solidity. Photo, G. W. Ritchie. If, then, we represent our Earth as a little ball of one inch diameter, the sun would be a big globe nine feet across and 323 yards away, that is about a fifth of a mile, four or five minutes walking. The moon would be a small p two feet and a half from the world. Between Earth and Sun there would be the two inner planets, Mercury and Venus, at distances of 125 and 250 yards from the Sun. All round and about these bodies there would be emptiness until you came to Mars, 175 feet beyond the Earth, Jupiter nearly a mile away, a foot in diameter, Saturn, a little smaller, two miles off, Uranus 4 miles off and Neptune 6 miles off. Then nothingness and nothingness except for small particles and drifting scraps of attenuated vapor for thousands of miles. The nearest star to Earth on this scale would be 40,000 miles away. These figures will serve perhaps to give one some conception of the immense emptiness of space in which the drama of life goes on. For in all this enormous vacancy of space we know certainly of life only upon the surface of our Earth. It does not penetrate much more than 3 miles down into the 4,000 miles that separate us from the center of our globe, and it does not reach more than 5 miles above its surface. Apparently all the limitlessness of space is otherwise empty and dead. The deepest ocean dredgings go down to 5 miles. The highest recorded flight of an aeroplane is little more than 4 miles. Men have reached to 7 miles up in balloons, but at a cost of great suffering. No bird can fly so high as 5 miles, and small birds and insects which have been carried up by aeroplanes drop off insensible far below that level. 2. The World in Time 
In the last 50 years there has been much very fine and interesting speculation on the part of scientific men upon the age and origin of our earth. Here we cannot pretend to give even a summary of such speculations because they involve the most subtle mathematical and physical considerations. The truth is that the physical and astronomical sciences are still too undeveloped as yet to make anything of the sort more than an illustrative guesswork. The general tendency has been to make the estimated age of our globe longer and longer. It now seems probable that the Earth has had an independent existence as a spinning planet flying round and round the Sun for a longer period than two billion years. It may have been much longer than that. This is a length of time that absolutely overpowers the imagination. Before that vast period of separate existence, the Sun and Earth and the other planets that circulate round the Sunday may have been a great swirl of diffused matter in space. The telescope reveals to us in various parts of the heavens luminous spiral clouds of matter, the spiral nebula, which appear to be in rotation about a center. It is supposed by many astronomers that the Sun and its planets were once such a spiral, and that their matter has undergone concentration into its present form. Through majestic eons that concentration went on until in that vast remoteness of the past for which we have given figures, the world and its moon were distinguishable. They were spinning then much faster than they are spinning now, they were at a lesser distance from the sun, they traveled round it very much faster, and they were probably incandescent or molten at the surface. The sun itself was a much greater blaze in the heavens. The Great Spiral Nebula The Great Spiral Nebula Photo, G. W. Ritchie if we could go back through that infinitude of time and see the Earth in this earlier stage of its history, we should behold a scene more like the interior of a blast furnace or the surface of a lava flow before it cools and cakes over than any other contemporary scene. No water would be visible because all the water there was would still be superheated steam in a stormy atmosphere of sulfurous and metallic vapors. Beneath this would swirl and boil an ocean of molten rock substance. Across a sky of fiery clouds the glare of the hurrying sun and moon would sweep swiftly like hot breaths of flame. A dark nebula. A dark nebula. Taken in 1920 with the aid of the largest telescope in the world. One of the first photographs taken by the Mount Wilson telescope. There are dark nebula and bright nebula. Professor Henry Norris Russell, against the British theory, holds that the dark nebula preceded the bright nebula. Photo, Professor Hale. Slowly by degrees as one million of years followed another, this fiery scene would lose its eruptive incandescence. The vapors in the sky would rain down and become less dense overhead, great slaggy cakes of solidifying rock would appear upon the surface of the molten sea and sink under it, to be replaced by other floating masses. The sun and moon growing now each more distant and each smaller, would rush with diminishing swiftness across the heavens. The moon now, because of its smaller size, would be already cooled far below incandescence, and would be alternately obstructing and reflecting the sunlight in a series of eclipses and full moons. Another spiral nebula. Another spiral nebula. Photo, G. W. Ritchie. And so with a tremendous slowness through the vastness of time, the earth would grow more and more like the earth on which we live, until at last an age would come when, in the cooling air, steam would begin to condense into clouds, and the first rain would fall hissing upon the first rocks below. For endless millennia the greater part of the earth's water would still be vaporized in the atmosphere, but there would now be hot streams running over the crystallizing rocks below and pools and lakes into which these streams would be carrying detritus and depositing sediment. Landscape before life. Landscape before life. Great lava-like masses of rock without traces of soil. At last a condition of things must have been attained in which a man might have stood up on earth and looked about him and lived. If we could have visited the earth at that time we should have stood on great lava-like masses of rock without a trace of soil or touch of living vegetation, under a storm-red sky. Hot and violent winds, exceeding the fiercest tornado that ever blows, and downpours of rain such as our milder, slower earth today knows nothing of, might have assailed us. The water of the downpour would have rushed by us, muddy with the spoils of the rocks, coming together into torrents, cutting deep gorges and canyons as they hurried past to deposit their sediment in the earliest seas. Through the clouds we should have glimpsed a great sun moving visibly across the sky, and in its wake and in the wake of the moon would have come a diurnal tide of earthquake and upheaval. And the moon, which nowadays keeps one constant face to earth, would then have been rotating visibly and showing the side it now hides so inexorably. The earth aged. One million years followed another, and the day lengthened, the sun grew more distant and milder, the moon's pace in the sky slackened, the intensity of rain and storm diminished and the water in the first seas increased and ran together into the ocean garment our planet henceforth wore but there was no life as yet upon the earth, the seas were lifeless, and the rocks were barren. 3. 
The beginnings of life. As everybody knows nowadays, the knowledge we possess of life before the beginnings of human memory and tradition is derived from the markings and fossils of living things in the stratified rocks. We find preserved in shale and slate, limestone, and sandstone, bones, shells, fibers, stems, fruits, footmarks, scratchings and the like, side by side with the ripple marks of the earliest tides and the pittings of the earliest rainfalls. It is by the sedulous examination of this record of the rocks that the past history of the Earth's life has been pieced together. That much nearly everybody knows today. The sedimentary rocks do not lie neatly stratum above stratum, they have been crumpled, bent, thrust about, distorted and mixed together like the leaves of a library that has been repeatedly looted and burnt, and it is only as a result of many devoted lifetimes of work that the record has been put into order and read. The whole compass of time represented by the record of the rocks is now estimated as 1,600,000,000 years. The earliest rocks in the record are called by geologists the Azoic rocks, because they show no traces of life. Great areas of these Azoic rocks lie uncovered in North America, and they are of such a thickness that geologists consider that they represent a period of at least half of the 1,600,000,000 which they assign to the whole geological record. Let me repeat this profoundly significant fact. Half the great interval of time since land and sea were first distinguishable on earth has left us no traces of life. There are ripplings and rain marks still to be found in these rocks, but no marks nor vestiges of any living thing. Marine life in the Cambrian period. Marine life in the Cambrian period. 1 and 8, jellyfishes, 2, hyalides, swimming snail, 3, humanocaries, 4, protospongia, 5, lampshells, obolella, 6, orthoceras, 7. Trilobite, Paradoxides, Sea Fossil on page 13. 9. Coral, Archaeocyathus, 10. Briagraptus, 11. Trilobite, Olinellus, 12. Palesterina. Then, as we come up the record, signs of past life appear and increase. The age of the world's history in which we find these past traces is called by geologists the Lower Paleozoic Age. The first indications that life was astir are vestiges of comparatively simple and lowly things, the shells of small shellfish, the stems and flower-like heads of zoophytes, seaweeds and the tracks and remains of sea worms and crustacea. Very early appear certain creatures rather like plant lice, crawling creatures which could roll themselves up into balls as the plant lice do, the trilobites. Later by a few million years or so come certain sea scorpions, more mobile and powerful creatures than the world had ever seen before. Fossil trilobite, slightly magnified. Fossil trilobite, slightly magnified, Photo, John J. Ward, F.E.S. None of these creatures were of very great size. Among the largest were certain of the sea scorpions, which measured 9 feet in length. There are no signs whatever of land life of any sort, plant or animal. There are no fishes nor any vertebrated creatures in this part of the record. Essentially all the plants and creatures which have left us their traces from this period of the Earth's history are shallow water and intertidal beings. If we wish to parallel the flora and fauna of the lower Paleozoic rocks on the Earth today, we should do it best, except in the matter of size, by taking a drop of water from a rock pool or scummy ditch and examining it under a microscope. The little crustacea, the small shellfish, the zoophytes and algae we should find there would display a quite striking resemblance to these clumsier, larger prototypes that once were the crown of life upon our planet. Early Paleolithic Fossils of Various Species of Lingula Early Paleolithic fossils of various species of lingula. Species of this most ancient genus of shellfish still live today. In Natural History Museum, London. It is well, however, to bear in mind that the lower Paleozoic rocks probably do not give us anything at all representative of the first beginnings of life on our planet. Unless a creature has bones or other hard parts, unless it wears a shell or is big enough and heavy enough to make characteristic footprints and trails in mud, it is unlikely to leave any fossilized traces of its existence behind. Today there are hundreds of thousands of species of small soft-bodied creatures in our world which it is inconceivable can ever leave any mark for future geologists to discover. In the world's past, millions of millions of species of such creatures may have lived and multiplied and flourished and passed away without a trace remaining. The waters of the warm and shallow lakes and seas of the so-called Azoic period may have teemed with an infinite variety of lowly, jelly-like, shell-less and boneless creatures, and a multitude of green scummy plants may have spread over the sunlit intertidal rocks and beaches. The record of the rocks is no more a complete record of life in the past than the books of a bank are a record of the existence of everybody in the neighborhood. It is only when a species begins to secrete a shallow or a spicula or a carapace or a lime-supported stem, 
and so put by something for the future, that it goes upon the record. But in rocks of an age prior to those which bear any fossil traces, graphite, a form of uncombined carbon, is sometimes found, and some authorities consider that it may have been separated out from combination through the vital activities of unknown living things. Fossilized footprints of a labyrinthodont carotherium. Fossilized footprints of a labyrinthodont carotherium. In Natural History Museum, London 4. The Age of Fishes. In the days when the world was supposed to have endured for only a few thousand years, it was supposed that the different species of plants and animals were fixed and final, they had all been created exactly as they are today, each species by itself. But as men began to discover and study the record of the rocks this belief gave place to the suspicion that many species had changed and developed slowly through the course of ages, and this again expanded into a belief in what is called organic evolution, a belief that all species of life upon earth, animal and vegetable alike, are descended by slow continuous processes of change from some very simple ancestral form of life, some almost structuralist living substance, far back in the so-called Azoic Seas. This question of organic evolution, like the question of the age of the earth, has in the past been the subject of much bitter controversy. There was a time when a belief in organic evolution was for rather obscure reasons supposed to be incompatible with sound Christian, Jewish and Muslim doctrine. That time has passed, and the men of the most orthodox Catholic, Protestant, Jewish and Mohammedan belief are now free to accept this newer and broader view of a common origin of all living things. No life seems to have happened suddenly upon earth. Life grew and grows. Age by age through gulfs of time at which imagination reels, life has been growing from a mere stirring in the intertidal slime towards freedom, power and consciousness. Life consists of individuals. These individuals are definite things, they are not like the lumps and masses, nor even the limitless and motionless crystals, of non-living matter, and they have two characteristics no dead matter possesses. They can assimilate other matter into themselves and make it part of themselves, and they can reproduce themselves. They eat and they breed. They can give rise to other individuals, for the most part like themselves, but always also a little different from themselves. There is a specific and family resemblance between an individual and its offspring, and there is an individual difference between every parent and every offspring it produces, and this is true in every species and at every stage of life. Specimen of the Terechthes malaria or sea scorpion showing body armor. Specimen of the Terechthes malaria or sea scorpion showing body armor. Now scientific men are not able to explain to us either why offspring should resemble nor why they should differ from their parents. But seeing that offspring do at once resemble and differ, it is a matter rather of common sense than of scientific knowledge that, if the conditions under which a species live are changed, the species should undergo some correlated changes. Because in any generation of the species there must be a number of individuals whose individual differences make them better adapted to the new conditions under which the species has to live, and a number whose individuals whose individual differences make it rather harder for them to live. And on the whole the former sort will live longer, bear more offspring, and reproduce themselves more abundantly than the latter, and so generation by generation the average of the species will change in the favorable direction. This process, which is called natural selection, is not so much a scientific theory as a necessary deduction from the facts of reproduction and individual difference. There may be many forces at work. Varying, destroying and preserving species, about which science may still be unaware or undecided, but the man who can deny the operation of this process of natural selection upon life since its beginning must be either ignorant of the elementary facts of life or incapable of ordinary thought. Many scientific men have speculated about the first beginning of life and their speculations are often of great interest, but there is absolutely no definite knowledge and no convincing guess yet of the way in which life began. But nearly all authorities are agreed that it probably began upon mud or sand in warm sunlit shallow brackish water, and that it spread up the beaches to the intertidal lines and out to the open waters. Fossil of the Clodosolachi, a Devonian shark fossil of the Clodosolachi, a Devonian shark. Nat. Hist. Moose. That early world was a world of strong tides and currents. An incessant destruction of individuals must have been going on through their being swept up the beaches and dried, or by their being swept out to sea and sinking down out of reach of air and sun. Early conditions favor the development of every tendency to root and hold on, every tendency to form an outer skin and casing to protect the stranded individual from immediate desiccation. From the very earliest any tendency to sensitiveness to taste would turn the individual in the direction of food and any sensitiveness to light would assist it to struggle back out of the darkness of the sea deeps and caverns or to wriggle back out of the excessive glare of the dangerous shallows. Probably the first shells and body armor of living things were protections against drying rather than against active. 
enemies. But tooth and claw come early into our earthly history. We have already noted the size of the earlier water scorpions. For long ages such creatures were the supreme lords of life. Then in a division of these Paleozoic rocks called the Silurian Division, which many geologists now suppose to be as old as 500 million years, there appears a new type of being, equipped with eyes and teeth and swimming powers of an altogether more powerful kind. These were the first known backboned animals, the earliest fishes, the first known vertebrate. Sharks and Ganoids of the Devonian Period Sharks and Ganoids of the Devonian Period by Alice Woodward These fishes increase greatly in the next division of rocks, the rocks known as the Devonian system. They are so prevalent that this period of the record of the rocks has been called the Age of Fishes. Fishes of a pattern now gone from the earth, and fishes allied to the sharks and sturgeons of today, rushed through the waters, leapt in the air, browsed among the seaweeds, pursued and preyed upon one another, and gave a new liveliness to the waters of the world. None of these were excessively big by our present standards. Few of them were more than two or three feet long, but there were exceptional forms which were as long as twenty feet. We know nothing from geology of the ancestors of these fishes. They do not appear to be related to any of the forms that preceded them. Zoologists have the most interesting views of their ancestry, but these they derive from the study of the development of the eggs of their still living relations, and from other sources. Apparently the ancestors of the vertebrate were soft-bodied and perhaps quite small. Swimming creatures who began first to develop hard parts as teeth round and about their mouths. The teeth of a skate or dogfish cover the roof and floor of its mouth and pass at the lip into the flattened tooth-like scales that encase most of its body. As the fishes develop these teeth scales in the geological record, they swim out of the hidden darkness of the past into the light, the first vertebrate animals visible in the record. V. The Age of the Coal Swamps The land during this age of fishes was apparently quite lifeless. Crags and uplands of barren rock lay under the sun and rain. There was no real soil, for as yet there were no earthworms which helped to make a soil, and no plants to break up the rock particles into mold, there was no trace of moss or lichen. Life was still only in the sea. Over this world of barren rock played great changes of climate. The causes of these changes of climate were very complex and they have still to be properly estimated. The changing shape of the Earth's orbit, the gradual shifting of the poles of rotation, changes in the shapes of the continents, probably even fluctuations in the warmth of the sun, now conspired to plunge great areas of the Earth's surface into long periods of cold and ice and now again for millions of years spread a warm or equable climate over this planet. There seem to have been phases of great internal activity in the world's history, when in the course of a few million years accumulated up for us would break out in lines of volcanic eruption and upheaval and rearrange the mountain and continental outlines of the globe, increasing the depth of the sea and the height of the mountains and exaggerating the extremes of climate and these would be followed by vast ages of comparative quiescence, when frost, rain and river would wear down the mountain heights and carry great masses of silt to fill and raise the sea bottoms and spread the seas, ever shallower and wider, over more and more of the land. There have been high and deep ages in the world's history and low and level ages. The reader must dismiss from his mind any idea that the surface of the earth has been growing steadily cooler since its crust grew solid. After that much cooling had been achieved, the internal temperature ceased to affect surface conditions. There are traces of periods of superabundant ice and snow, of glacial ages, that is, even in the Azoic period. It was only towards the close of the age of fishes, in a period of extensive shallow seas and lagoons, that life spread itself out in any effectual way from the waters onto the land. No doubt the earlier types of the forms that now begin to appear in great abundance had already been developing in a rare and obscure manner for many scores of millions of years but now came their opportunity. A Carboniferous Swamp A Carboniferous Swamp A coal seam in the making Plants no doubt preceded animal forms in this invasion of the land, but the animals probably followed up the plant emigration very closely. The first problem that the plant had to solve was the problem of some sustaining stiff support to hold up its fronds to the sunlight when the buoyant water was withdrawn. The second was the problem of getting water from the swampy ground below to the tissues of the plant, now that it was no longer close at hand. The two problems were solved by the development of woody tissue which both sustained the plant and acted as water carrier to the leaves. The record of the rocks is suddenly crowded by a vast variety of woody swamp plants, many of them of great size, big tree mosses, tree ferns, gigantic horsetails and the like. And with these, age by age, there crawled out of the water a great variety of animal forms. There were centipedes and millipedes, there were the first primitive insects, there were creatures related to the ancient king crabs and sea scorpions which became the earliest spiders. And land scorpions, and presently there were vertebrated animals. 
skull of a labyrinthodont, Capitosaurus skull of a labyrinthodont, Capitosaurus gnat. Hist. Moose. Some of the earlier insects were very large. There were dragonflies in this period with wings that spread out to 29 inches. In various ways these new orders and genera had adapted themselves to breathing air. Hitherto all animals had breathed air dissolved in water, and that indeed is what all animals still have to do. But now in divers' fashions the animal kingdom was acquiring the power of supplying its own moisture where it was needed. A man with a perfectly dry lung would suffocate today, his lung surfaces must be moist in order that air may pass through them into his blood. The adaptation to air breathing consists in all cases either in the development of a cover to the old-fashioned gills to stop evaporation, or in the development of tubes or other new breathing organs lying deep inside the body and moistened by a watery secretion. The old gills with which the ancestral fish of the vertebrated line had breathed were inadaptable to breathing upon land, and in a case of this division of the animal kingdom it is the swimming bladder of the fish which becomes a new, deep-seated breathing organ, the lung. The kind of animals known as amphibia, the frogs and newts of today, begin their lives in the water and breathe by gills, and subsequently the lung, developing in the same way as the swimming bladder of many fishes do, as a bag-like outgrowth from the throat, takes over the business of breathing, the animal comes out on land, and the gills dwindle and the gill slits disappear. All except an outgrowth of one gill slit, which becomes the passage of the ear and eardrum, the animal can now live only in the air. But it must return at least to the edge of the water to lay its eggs and reproduce its kind. Skeleton of a labyrinthodont, the Ariops skeleton of a labyrinthodont, the Ariops gnat. Hist. Moose. All the air breathing vertebrate of this age of swamps and plants belong to the class amphibia. They were nearly all of them forms related to the newts of today, and some of them attained a considerable size. They were land animals, it is true, but they were land animals needing to live in a near moist and swampy places, and all the great trees of this period were equally amphibious in their habits. None of them had yet developed fruits and seeds of a kind that could fall on land and develop with the help only of such moisture as dew and rain could bring. They all had to shed their spores in water, it would seem, if they were to germinate. It is one of the most beautiful interests of the beautiful science, comparative anatomy, to trace the complex and wonderful adaptations of living things to the necessities of existence in air. All living things, plants and animals alike, are primarily water things. For example all the higher vertebrated animals above the fishes, up to and including man, pass through a stage in their development in the egg or before birth in which they have gill slits which are obliterated before the young emerge. The bear, water-washed eye of the fish is protected in the higher forms from drying up by eyelids and glands which secrete moisture. The weaker sound vibrations of air necessitate an eardrum. In nearly every organ of the body similar modifications and adaptations are to be detected, similar patchings up to meet aerial conditions. This Carboniferous Age, this age of the amphibia, was an age of life in the swamps and lagoons and on the low banks among these waters. Thus far life had now extended. The hills and high lands were still quite barren and lifeless. Life had learned to breathe air indeed, but it still had its roots in its native water, it still had to return to the water to reproduce its kind. Vi. The Age of Reptiles. The abundant life of the Carboniferous period was succeeded by a vast cycle of dry and bitter ages. They are represented in the record of the rocks by thick deposits of sandstones and the like, in which fossils are comparatively few. The temperature of the world fluctuated widely, and there were long periods of glacial cold. Over great areas the former profusion of swamp vegetation ceased, and, overlaid by these newer deposits, it began that process of compression and mineralization that gave the world most of the coal deposits of today. But it is during periods of change that life undergoes its most rapid modifications, and under hardship that it learns its hardest lessons. As conditions revert towards warmth and moisture again we find a new series of animal and plant forms established, we find in the record the remains of vertebrated animals that laid eggs which, instead of hatching out tadpoles which needed to live for a time in water, carried on their development before hatching to a stage so nearly like the adult form that the young could live in air from the first moment of independent existence. Gills had been cut out altogether, and the gill slits only appeared as an embryonic phase. These new creatures without a tadpole stage were the reptiles. Concurrently there had been a development of seed-bearing trees, which could spread their seed, independently of swamp or lakes. There were now palm-like cycads and many tropical conifers, though as yet there were no flowering plants and no grasses. There was a great number of ferns. And there was now also an increased variety of insects. There were beetles, though bees and butterflies had yet to come. But all the fundamental forms of a new real land fauna and flora had been laid down during these vast ages of severity. 
this new land life needed only the opportunity of favorable conditions to flourish and prevail. A fossil ichthyosaurus, a Mesozoic fish lizard A fossil ichthyosaurus, a Mesozoic fish lizard. Found in the lower Leas in Somersetshire. Nat. Hist. Moose. Age by age and with abundant fluctuations that mitigation came. The still incalculable movements of the Earth's crust, the changes in its orbit, the increase and diminution of the mutual inclination of orbit and pole, worked together to produce a great spell of widely diffused warm conditions. The period lasted altogether, it is now supposed, upwards of 200 million years. It is called the Mesozoic period, to distinguish it from the altogether vaster Paleozoic and Azoic periods, together 1400 millions, that preceded it, and from the Cainozoic or New Life period that intervened between its close and the present time, and it is also called the Age of Reptiles because of the astonishing predominance and variety of this form of life. It came to an end some 80 million years ago. In the world today the genera of reptiles are comparatively few and their distribution is very limited. They are more various, it is true, than are the few surviving members of the order of the amphibia which once in the Carboniferous period ruled the world. We still have the snakes, the turtles and tortoises, the chelonia, the alligators and crocodiles, and the lizards. Without exception they are creatures requiring warmth all the year round, they cannot stand exposure to cold, and it is probable that all the reptilian beings of the Mesozoic suffered under the same limitation. It was a hothouse fauna, living amidst a hothouse flora. It endured no frosts. But the world had at least attained a real dry land fauna and flora as distinguished from the mud and swamp fauna and flora of the previous heyday of life upon earth. A pterodactyl. A pterodactyl. Nat. Hist. Moose. All the sorts of reptile we know now were much more abundantly represented than great turtles and tortoises, big crocodiles and many lizards and snakes, but in addition there was a number of series of wonderful creatures that have now vanished altogether from the earth. There was a vast variety of beings called the dinosaurs. Vegetation was now spreading over the lower levels of the world, reeds, brakes of fern and the like, and browsing upon this abundance came a multitude of herbivorous reptiles, which increased in size as the Mesozoic period rose to its climax. Some of these beasts succeeded in size any other land animals that have ever lived, they were as large as whales. The Diplodocus carnigi for example measured 84 feet from snout to tail, the Gigantosaurus was even greater, it measured 100 feet. Living upon these monsters was a swarm of carnivorous dinosaurs of a corresponding size. One of these, the Tyrannosaurus, is figured and described in many books as the last word in reptilian frightfulness. A big swamp inhabiting dinosaur, the Diplodocus, over 80 feet from snout to tail tip. A big swamp inhabiting dinosaur, the Diplodocus, over 80 feet from snout to tail tip. Nat. Hist. Moose. While these great creatures pastured and pursued amidst the fronds and evergreens of the Mesozoic jungles, another now vanished tribe of reptiles, with a bat-like development of the four limbs, pursued insects and one another, first leapt and parachuted and presently flew amidst the fronds and branches of the forest trees. These were the pterodactyls. These were the first flying creatures with backbones, they mark a new achievement in the growing powers of vertebrated life. Moreover some of the reptiles were returning to the sea waters. Three groups of big swimming beings had invaded the sea from which their ancestors had come, the mosasaurs, the plesiosaurs, and ichthyosaurs. Some of these again approached the proportions of our present whales. The ichthyosaurs seem to have been quite seagoing creatures, but the plesiosaurs were a type of animal that has no cognate form today. The body was stout and big with paddles, adapted either for swimming or crawling through marshes, or along the bottom of shallow waters. The comparatively small head was poised on a vast snake of neck, altogether outdoing the neck of the swan. Either the plesiosaur swam and searched for food under the water and fed as the swan will do, or it lurked under water and snatched at passing fish or beast. Such was the predominant land life throughout the Mesozoic Age. It was by our human standards in advance upon anything that had preceded it. It had produced land animals greater in size, range, power and activity, more vital as people say, than anything the world had seen before. In the seas there had been no such advance but a great proliferation of new forms of life. An enormous variety of squid-like creatures with chambered shells, for the most part coiled, had appeared in the shallow seas, the ammonites. They had had predecessors in the Paleozoic seas, but now was their age of glory. Today they have left. No survivors at all, their nearest relation is the pearly nautilus, an inhabitant of tropical waters. And a new and more prolific type of fish with lighter, finer scales than the plate-like and tooth-like coverings that had hitherto prevailed, became and has since remained predominant in the seas and rivers. 7. The first birds and the first mammals. 
in a few paragraphs a picture of the lush vegetation and swarming reptiles of that first great summer of life, the Mesozoic period, has been sketched. But while the dinosaurs lorded it over the hot selvas and marshy plains and the pterodactyls filled the forest with their flutterings and possibly with shrieks and croakings as they pursued the humming insect life of the still flowerless shrubs and trees, some less conspicuous and less abundant forms upon the margins of this abounding life were acquiring certain powers and learning certain lessons of endurance, that were to be of the utmost value to their race when at last the smiling generosity of sun and earth began to fade. A group of tribes and genera of hopping reptiles, small creatures of the dinosaur type, seem to have been pushed by competition and the pursuit of their enemies towards the alternatives of extinction or adaptation to colder conditions in the higher hills or by the sea. Among these distressed tribes there was developed a new type of scale, scales that were elongated into quill-like forms and that presently branched into the crude beginnings of feathers. These quill-like scales lay over one another and formed a heat-retaining covering more efficient than any reptilian covering that had hitherto existed. So they permitted an invasion of colder regions that were otherwise uninhabited. Perhaps simultaneously with these changes there arose in these creatures a greater solicitude for their eggs. Most reptiles are apparently quite careless about their eggs, which are left for sun and season to hatch. But some of the varieties. Upon this new branch of the tree of life were acquiring a habit of guarding their eggs and keeping them warm with the warmth of their bodies. With these adaptations to cold other internal modifications were going on that made these creatures, the primitive birds, warm-blooded and independent of basking. The very earliest birds seem to have been seabirds living upon fish, and their four limbs were not wings but paddles rather after the penguin type. That peculiarly primitive bird, the New Zealand kiwi, has feathers of a very simple sort, and neither flies nor appears to be descended from flying ancestors. In the development of the birds, feathers came before wings. But once the feather was developed the possibility of making a light spread of feathers led inevitably to the wing. We know of the fossil remains of one bird at least which had reptilian teeth in its jaw and a long reptilian tail, but which also had a true bird's wing and which certainly flew and held its own among the pterodactyls of the Mesozoic time. Nevertheless birds were neither varied nor abundant in Mesozoic times. If a man could go back to typical Mesozoic country, he might walk for days and never see or hear such a thing as a bird, though he would see a great abundance of pterodactyls and insects among the fronds and reeds. Fossil of the Archaeopteryx, one of the earliest birds. Fossil of the Archaeopteryx, one of the earliest birds. Net. Hist. Moose. And another thing he would probably never see, and that would be any sign of a mammal. Probably the first mammals were in existence millions of years before the first thing one could call a bird, but they were altogether too small and obscure and remote for attention. Hesperornis in its native seas. Hesperornis in its native seas. The earliest mammals, like the earliest birds, were creatures driven by competition and pursued into a life of hardship and adaptation to cold. With them also the scale became quill-like, and was developed into a heat-retaining covering, and they too underwent modifications, similar in kind though different in detail, to become warm-blooded and independent of basking. Instead of feathers they developed hairs, and instead of guarding and incubating their eggs they kept them warm and safe by retaining them inside their bodies until they were almost mature. Most of them became altogether viviparous and brought their young into the world alive. And even after their young were born they tended to maintain a protective and nutritive association with them. Most but not all mammals today have mame and suckle their young. Two mammals still live which lay eggs and which have not proper mame, though they nourish their young by a nutritive secretion of the underskin, these are the duck-billed platypus and the echidna. The echidna lays leathery eggs and then puts them into a pouch under its belly, and so carries them about warm and safe until they hatch. But just as a visitor to the Mesozoic world might have searched for days and weeks before finding a bird, so, unless he knew exactly where to go and look, he might have searched in vain for any traces of a mammal. Both birds and mammals would have seemed very eccentric and secondary and unimportant creatures in Mesozoic times. The Kiwi, Apteryx, still found in New Zealand The Kiwi, Apteryx, still found in New Zealand. Photo Autotype Fine Art Company. Slab of Lower Pliocene Marl. Slab of Lower Pliocene Marl. Discovered in Greece, it is rich in fossilized bones of early mammals. The age of reptiles lasted, it is now guessed, 80 million years. Had any quasi-human intelligence been watching the world through that inconceivable length of time, how safe and eternal the sunshine and abundance must have seemed, how assured the wallowing prosperity of the dinosaurs and the flapping abundance of the flying lizards. And then the mysterious rhythms and accumulating forces of the universe began to turn against that quasi-eternal stability. That run of luck for life was running out. Age by age, myriad of years after myriad of years, 
with halts no doubt and retrogressions, came a change towards hardship and extreme conditions, came great alterations of level and great redistributions of mountain and sea. We find one thing in the record of the rocks during the decadence of the long Mesozoic Age of Prosperity that is very significant of steadily sustained changes of condition, and that is a violent fluctuation of living forms and the appearance of new and strange species. Under the gathering threat of extinction the older orders and genera are displaying their utmost capacity for variation and adaptation. The Ammonites for example in these last pages of the Mesozoic chapter exhibit a multitude of fantastic forms. Under settled conditions there is no encouragement for novelties, they do not develop, they are suppressed, what is best adapted is already there. Under novel conditions it is the ordinary type that suffers, and the novelty that may have a better chance to survive and establish itself. There comes a break in the record of the rocks that may represent several million years. There is a veil here still, over even the outline of the history of life. When it lifts again, the age of reptiles is at an end, the dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, the pterodactyls, the innumerable genera and species of ammonite have all gone absolutely. In all their stupendous variety they have died out and left no descendants. The cold has killed them. All their final variations were insufficient, they had never hit upon survival conditions. The world had passed through a phase of extreme conditions beyond their powers of endurance, a slow and complete massacre of Mesozoic life has occurred, and we find now a new scene, a new and hardier flora, and a new and hardier fauna in possession of the world. It is still a bleak and impoverished scene with which this new volume of the Book of Life begins. The cycads and tropical conifers have given place very largely to trees that shed their leaves to avoid destruction by the snows of winter and to flowering plants and shrubs, and where there was formerly a profusion of reptiles, an increasing variety of birds and mammals is entering into their inheritance. 8. The Age of Mammals The opening of the next great period in the life of the Earth, the Cainozoic period, was a period of upheaval and extreme volcanic activity. Now it was that the vast masses of the Alps and Himalayas and the mountain backbone of the Rockies and Andes were thrust up, and that the rude outlines of our present oceans and continents appeared. The map of the world begins to display a first dim resemblance to the map of today. It is estimated now that between 40 and 80 million years have elapsed from the beginnings of the Cainozoic period to the present time. At the outset of the Cainozoic period the climate of the world was austere. It grew generally warmer until a fresh phase of great abundance was reached, after which conditions grew hard again, and the earth passed into a series of extremely cold cycles, the glacial ages, from which apparently it is now slowly emerging. But we do not know sufficient of the causes of climatic change at present to forecast the possible fluctuations of climatic conditions that lie before us. We may be moving towards increasing sunshine or lapsing towards another glacial age, volcanic activity and the upheaval of mountain masses may be increasing or diminishing, we do not know, we lack sufficient science. With the opening of this period the grasses appear, for the first time there is pasture in the world, and with the full development of the once obscure mammalian type, appear a number of interesting grazing animals and of carnivorous types which prey upon these. At first these early mammals seem to differ only in a few characters from the great herbivorous and carnivorous reptiles that ages before had flourished and then vanished from the earth. A careless observer might suppose that in this second long age of warmth and plenty that was now beginning, nature was merely repeating the first, with herbivorous and carnivorous mammals to parallel the herbivorous and carnivorous dinosaurs, with birds replacing pterodactyls and so on. But this would be an altogether superficial comparison. The variety of the universe is infinite and incessant, it progresses eternally, history never repeats itself and no parallels are precisely true. The differences between the life of the Cainozoic and Mesozoic periods are far profounder than the resemblances. A mammal of the early Cainozoic period, a mammal of the early Cainozoic period, the Titanotherum, Brontops, Robustum. The most fundamental of all these differences lies in the mental life of the two periods. It arises essentially out of the continuing contact of parent and offspring, which distinguishes mammalian and, in a lesser degree, bird life, from the life of the reptile. With very few exceptions, the reptile abandons its egg to hatch alone. The young reptile has no knowledge whatever of its parent, its mental life, such as it is begins and ends with its own experiences. It may tolerate the existence of its fellows but it has no communication with them, it never imitates, never learns from them, is incapable of concerted action with them. Its life is that of an isolated individual. But with the suckling and cherishing of young which was distinctive of the new mammalian and avian strains arose the possibility of learning by imitation, of communication, by warning cries and other concerted action, of mutual control and instruction a teachable type of life had come into the world. 
The earliest mammals of the Cainozoic period are but little superior in brain size to the more active carnivorous dinosaurs, but as we read on through the record towards modern times we find, in every tribe and race of the mammalian animals, a steady universal increase in brain capacity. For instance we find at a comparatively early stage that rhinoceros-like beasts appear. There is a creature, the Titanotherium, which lived in the earliest division of this period. It was probably very like a modern rhinoceros in its habits and needs, but its brain capacity was not one-tenth that of its living successor. The earlier mammals probably parted from their offspring as soon as suckling was over, but, once the capacity for mutual understanding has arisen, the advantages of continuing the association are very great, and we presently find a number of mammalian species displaying the beginnings of a true social life and keeping together in herds, packs and flocks, watching each other, imitating each other, taking warning from each other's acts and cries. This is something that the world had not seen before among vertebrate animals. Reptiles and fish may no doubt be found in swarms and shoals, they have been hatched in quantities and similar conditions have kept them together, but in the case of the social and gregarious mammals the association arises not simply from a community of external forces, it is sustained by an inner impulse. They are not merely like one another and so found in the same places at the same times, they like one another and so they keep together. Stenomalus hitchcocki a giraffe camel Stenomalus hitchcocki, a giraffe camel gnat. Hist. Moose. Skeleton of Protohippus venticulus, early horse. Skeleton of Protohippus venticulus, early horse. Gnat. Hist. Moose. This difference between the reptile world and the world of our human minds is when our sympathies seem unable to pass. We cannot conceive in ourselves the swift uncomplicated urgency of a reptile's instinctive motives, its appetites, fears and hates. We cannot understand them in their simplicity because all our motives are complicated, ours are balances and resultants and not simple urgencies. But the mammals and birds have self-restraint and consideration for other individuals, a social appeal, a self-control that is, at its lower level, after our own fashion. We can in consequence establish relations with almost all sorts of them. When they suffer they utter cries and make movements that rouse our feelings. We can make understanding pets of them with a mutual recognition. They can be tamed to self-restraint towards us, domesticated and taught. Comparative sizes of brains of rhinoceros and dinoceros. Comparative sizes of brains of rhinoceros and dinoceros. Nat. Hist. Moose. That unusual growth of brain which is the central fact of Cainozoic times marks a new communication and interdependence of individuals. It foreshadows the development of human societies of which we shall soon be telling. As the Cainozoic period unrolled, the resemblance of its flora and fauna to the plants and animals that inhabit the world today increased. The big clumsy Uintateres and Titanoteres, the Entelodonts and Hyracodons, big clumsy. Roots like nothing living, disappeared. On the other hand a series of forms led up by steady degrees from grotesque and clumsy predecessors to the giraffes, camels, horses, elephants, deer, dogs and lions and tigers of the existing world. The evolution of the horse is particularly legible upon the geological record. We have a fairly complete series of forms from a small taper-like ancestor in the early Cainozoic. Another line of development that has now been pieced together with some precision is that of the llamas and camels. 9. Monkeys, Apes and Submen Naturalists divide the class Mammalia into a number of orders. At the head of these is the order primates, which includes the lemurs, the monkeys, apes and man. Their classification was based originally upon anatomical resemblances and took no account of any metal qualities. Now the past history of the primates is one very difficult to decipher in the geological record. They are for the most part animals which live in forests like the lemurs and monkeys or in bare rocky places like the baboons. They are rarely drowned and covered up by sediment, nor are most of them very numerous species, and so they do not figure so largely among the fossils as the ancestors of the horses, camels and so forth do but we know that quite early in the Cainozoic period, that is to say some 40 million years ago or so, primitive monkeys and lemuroid creatures had appeared, poorer in brain and not so specialized as their later successors. The great world summer of the middle Cainozoic period drew at last to an end. It was to follow those other two great summers in the history of life, the summer of the coal swamps and the vast summer of the age of reptiles. Once more the earth spun towards an ice age. The world chilled, grew milder for a time and chilled again. In the warm past hippopotami had wallowed through a lush subtropical vegetation, and a tremendous tiger with fangs like sabers, the saber-toothed tiger, had hunted its prey where now the journalists of Fleet Street go to and fro. Now came a bleaker age and still bleaker ages. A great weeding and extinction of species occurred. 
a woolly rhinoceros, adapted to a cold climate, and the mammoth, a big woolly cousin of the elephants, the arctic muskox and the reindeer passed across the scene. Then century by century the arctic ice cap, the wintry death of the great ice age, crept southward. In England it came almost down to the Thames, in America it reached Ohio. There would be warmer spells of a few thousand years and relapses towards a bitterer cold. Geologists talk of these wintry phases as the first, second, third, and fourth glacial ages, and of the interludes as interglacial periods. We live today in a world that is still impoverished and scarred by that terrible winter. The first glacial age was coming on 600,000 years ago, the fourth glacial age reached its bitterest some 50,000 years ago. And it was amidst the snows of this long universal winter that the first man-like beings lived upon our planet. A mammoth. A mammoth. By the Middle Cainozoic period there have appeared various apes with many quasi-human attributes of the jaws and leg bones, but it is only as we approach these glacial ages that we find traces of creatures that we can speak of as almost human. These traces are not bones but implements. In Europe, in deposits of this period, between half a million and a million years old, we find flints and stones that have evidently been chipped intentionally by some handy creature desirous of hammering, scraping or fighting with the sharpened edge. These things have been called eoliths, dawn stones. In Europe there are no bones nor other remains of the creature which made these objects, simply the objects themselves. For all the certainty we have it may have been some entirely unhuman but intelligent monkey. But at Trinilin Java, in accumulations of this age, a piece of a skull and various teeth and bones have been found of a sort of ape-man, with a brain case bigger than that of any living apes, which seems to have walked erect. This creature is now called Pithecanthropus erectus, the walking ape-man, and the little trayful of its bones is the only help our imaginations have as yet in figuring to, ourselves the makers of the eoliths. Flint implements found in Piltdown region Flint implements found in Piltdown region Nat. Hist. Moose. It is not until we come to sands that are almost a quarter of a million years old that we find any other particle of a subhuman being. But there are plenty of implements, and they are steadily improving in quality as we read on through the record. They are no longer clumsy eoliths, they are now shapely instruments made with considerable skill. And they are much bigger than the similar implements afterwards made by true man. Then, in a sand pit at Heidelberg, appears a single quasi-human jawbone, a clumsy jawbone, absolutely chinless, far heavier than a true human jawbone and narrower, so that it is improbable the creature's tongue could have moved about for articulate speech. On the strength of this jawbone, scientific men suppose this creature to have been a heavy, almost human monster, possibly with huge limbs and hands, possibly with a thick felt of hair, and they call it the Heidelberg Man. A Theoretical Restoration of the Pithecanthropus Erectus by Professor Ruddock A Theoretical Restoration of the Pithecanthropus Erectus by Professor Ruddock this jawbone is, I think, one of the most tormenting objects in the world to our human curiosity. To see it is like looking through a defective glass into the past and catching just one blurred and tantalizing glimpse of this thing, shambling through the bleak wilderness, clambering to avoid the saber-toothed tiger, watching the woolly rhinoceros in the woods. Then before we can scrutinize the monster, he vanishes. Yet the soil is littered abundantly with the indestructible implements he chipped out for his uses. The Heidelberg Man the Heidelberg Man. The Heidelberg Man, as modeled under the supervision of Professor Rutta. Still more fascinatingly enigmatical are the remains of a creature found at Piltdown in Sussex in a deposit that may indicate an age between 100 and 150,000 years ago, though some authorities would put these particular remains back in time to before the Heidelberg jawbone. Here there are the remains of a thick subhuman skull much larger than any existing apes, and a chimpanzee like jawbone which may or may not belong to it, and, in addition, a bat-shaped piece of elephant bone evidently carefully manufactured, through which a hole had apparently been bored. There is also the thigh bone of a deer with cuts upon it like a tally. That is all. The Piltdown Skull, as reconstructed from original fragment. The Piltdown Skull, as reconstructed from original fragment. Nat. Hist. Moose. What sort of beast was this creature which sat and bored holes in bones? Scientific men have named him Eoanthropus, the Dawn Man. He stands apart from his kindred, a very different being either from the Heidelberg creature or from any living ape. No other vestige like him is known. But the gravels and deposits of from 100,000 years onward are increasingly rich in implements of flint and similar stone. And these implements are no longer rude eoliths. The archaeologists are presently able to distinguish scrapers, borers, knives, darts, throwing stones and hand axes. We are drawing very near to man. 
In our next section we shall have to describe the strangest of all these precursors of humanity, the Neanderthalers, the men who were almost, but not quite, true men. But it may be well perhaps to state quite clearly here that no scientific man supposes either of these creatures, the Heidelberg man or Eoanthropus, to be direct ancestors of the men of today. These are, at the closest, related forms. X. The Neanderthaler and the Rhodesian man. About 50 or 60,000 years ago, before the climax of the fourth glacial age, there lived a creature on earth so like a man that until a few years ago its remains were considered to be altogether human. We have skulls and bones of it and a great accumulation of the large implements it made and used. It made fires. It sheltered in caves from the cold. It probably dressed skins roughly and wore them. It was right-handed as men are. Yet now the ethnologists tell us these creatures were not true men. They were of a different species of the same genus. They had heavy protruding jaws and great brow ridges above the eyes and very low foreheads. Their thumbs were not opposable to the fingers as men's are, their necks were so poised that they could not turn back their heads and look up to the sky. They probably slouched along, head down and forward. Their chinless jawbones resemble the Heidelberg jawbone and are markedly unlike human jawbones. And there were great differences from the human pattern in their teeth. Their cheek teeth were more complicated in structure than ours, more complicated, and not less so. They had not the long fangs of our cheek teeth, and also these quasi-men had not the marked canines, dog teeth, of an ordinary human being. The capacity of their skulls was quite human, but the brain was bigger behind and lower in front than the human brain. Their intellectual faculties were differently arranged. They were not ancestral to the human line. Mentally and physically they were upon a different line from the human line. Skulls and bones of this extinct species of man were found at Neanderthal among other places, and from that place these strange proto-men have been christened Neanderthal men, or Neanderthalers. They must have endured in Europe for many hundreds or even thousands of years. The Neanderthaler, according to Professor Rudd the Neanderthaler, according to Professor Rudd. At that time the climate and geography of our world was very different from what they are at the present time. Europe for example was covered with ice reaching as far south as the Thames and into central Germany and Russia, there was no channel separating Britain from France, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea were great valleys, with perhaps a chain of lakes in their deeper portions, and a great inland sea spread from the present Black Sea across South Russia and far into Central Asia. Spain and all of Europe not actually under ice consisted of bleak uplands under a harder climate than that of Labrador, and it was only when North Africa was reached that one would have found a temperate climate. Across the cold steppes of southern Europe with its sparse Arctic vegetation, drifted such hardy creatures as the woolly mammoth, and woolly rhinoceros, great oxen and reindeer, no doubt following the vegetation northward in spring and southward in autumn. Map, possible outline of Europe and Western Asia at the maximum of the Fourth Ice Age, about 50,000 years ago. Such was the scene through which the Neanderthaler wandered, gathering such subsistence as he could from small game or fruits and berries and roots. Possibly he was mainly a vegetarian, chewing twigs and roots. His level elaborate teeth suggest a largely vegetarian dietary. But we also find the long marrow bones of great animals in his caves, cracked to extract the marrow. His weapons could not have been of much avail in open conflict with great beasts, but it is supposed that he attacked them with spears at difficult river crossings and even constructed pitfalls for them. Possibly he followed the herds and preyed upon any dead that were killed in fights, and perhaps he played the part of jackal to the saber-toothed tiger which still survived in his day. Possibly in the bitter hardships of the glacial ages this creature had taken to attacking animals after long ages of vegetarian adaptation. We cannot guess what this Neanderthal man looked like. He may have been very hairy and very unhuman looking indeed. It is even doubtful if he went erect. He may have used his knuckles as well as his feet to hold himself up. Probably he went about alone or in small family groups. It is inferred from the structure of his jaw that he was incapable of speech as we understand it. For thousands of years these Neanderthalers were the highest animals that the European area had ever seen, and then some 30 or 35,000 years ago as the climate grew warmer a race of kindred beings, more intelligent, knowing more, talking and cooperating together, came drifting into the Neanderthalers' world from the south. They ousted the Neanderthalers from their caves and squatting places, they hunted the same food, they probably made war upon their grisly predecessors and killed them off. These newcomers from the south or the east, for at present we do not know their region of origin, who at last drove the Neanderthalers out of existence altogether, were beings of our own blood and kin, the first true men. Their brain cases and thumbs and necks and teeth were anatomically the same as our own. In a cave at Cro-Magnon and in another at Grimaldi, a number of skeletons have 
been found, the earliest truly human remains that are so far known. So it is our race comes into the record of the rocks, and the story of mankind begins. Comparison of, 1. Modern Skull and, 2. Rhodesian Skull. Comparison of, 1. Modern Skull and, 2. Rhodesian Skull. Nat. Hist. Moose. The world was growing like our own in those days though the climate was still austere. The glaciers of the Ice Age were receding in Europe, the reindeer of France and Spain presently gave way to great herds of horses as grass increased upon the steppes, and the mammoth became more and more rare in southern Europe and finally receded northward altogether. We do not know where the true men first originated. But in the summer of 1921, an extremely interesting skull was found together with pieces of a skeleton at Broken Hill in South Africa, which seems to be a relic of a third sort of man, intermediate in its characteristics between the Neanderthaler and the human being. The brain case indicates a brain bigger in front and smaller behind than the Neanderthalers, and the skull was poised erect upon the backbone in a quite human way. The teeth also and the bones are quite human. But the face must have been ape-like with enormous brow ridges and a ridge along the middle of the skull. The creature was indeed a true man, so to speak, with an ape-like, Neanderthaler face. This Rhodesian man is evidently still closer to real men than the Neanderthal man. This Rhodesian skull is probably only the second of what in the end may prove to be a long list of finds of subhuman species which lived on the earth in the vast interval of time between the beginnings of the Ice Age and the appearance of their common heir, and perhaps their common exterminator, the true man. The Rhodesian skull itself may not be very ancient. Up to the time of publishing this book there has been no exact determination of its probable age. It may be that this subhuman creature survived in South Africa until quite recent times.